It's good to have you here this morning. Hope you're doing well. If you brought your Bible, we're going to be in the book of Micah. The book of Micah. Micah chapter 6 specifically. So if you want to turn there, you can. The book of Micah. We're continuing on with our, uh, in this last month uh, of this summer quarter with our class, uh, kind of a treating it as a survey of the Old Testament, but we're calling it God's story in seven sentences and looking at seven key passages from the Old Testament that really speak uh, to just the story that God is, is, uh, is unfolding throughout the pages of human history. No, I'm using the word story, uh, and maybe something like a fairy tale or a myth comes to mind, but that's not the case. Everything we're looking at is historical, everything is true, uh, but it, they provide, these passages provide a summary uh, of the, of the uh, story. So I hope that you're actually reading around the stuff that we're looking at, even though we're landing on just one verse for the sake of time, I hope that you are reading everything that surrounds it. So I hope you will read the book of Micah, uh, read the prophets, and, um, and really just get a good idea of what's going on in, in the time of God's people in, in the historical uh, time period. So Micah chapter 6 is where we are. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for today, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the time it's been set aside to encourage each other and to build one another up, uh, to have our hearts and our minds refocus and reset on you, uh, to seek you and your kingdom first. And we pray, Father, that we have come uh, into your presence with hearts ready uh, to give you the worship and the honor and the glory due to your name and all that you have done for us, especially through Jesus Christ. We're thankful, Father, for the story that unfolds throughout the pages of human history throughout Israel and Judah, and later on through Christ, the apostles in the first century church. Father, remind us of our place in this. And remind us of our responsibility and obligation to share this, this, this story, which is called the gospel, uh, with all those that are around us, to let them know how much you love them and how much you care for them, just as you love us and care for us. We thank you, Father, for being good to us, being kind and gracious and merciful, we thank you for Christ. We're thankful that all of these blessings and so many more are found in him and only in him. And we pray, Father, that we never lose sight of that and that we don't take that for granted. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, a passage well known uh, to many of us. But if I could have a volunteer to read that, it doesn't matter who, just uh, whoever sees verse 8 first, just start reading it for me, please. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. All right. So we'll get into this spot later on in this class, if not in the next week, uh, for sure. Uh, but Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, one of the reasons why we chose it is that it summarizes the Old Testament uh, from a practical standpoint for Israel. What does God require? What does God expect? What does God want? What is God looking for with those who wear his name and follow him? Well, to do justice, to love kindness, or some of you may have a version that says steadfast love, and to walk humbly, an individual who brings themselves under, under God's leadership. But the reason why we chose also Micah is that Micah stands as a representation of the prophets. And the prophets are one of those that we just don't pay as much attention to as we probably should. If I were to ask you to name a prophet or two, you would probably go with Elisha, you would go with Elijah, you may say Samuel, uh, you probably would say Nathan. Uh, and those are well, those are good, but they're not the only prophets. So who are the prophets? Well, biblically speaking, the prophets consisted of a large amount of men, of men and a few women. Deborah is considered to be a prophet. Miriam is considered to be a prophet. But the prophets throughout Israel's history and Judah's history are mostly men. Uh, but they are also designated as the books, the Old Testament, 15 books. By the way, remind me how many books are in the Old Testament total? 39, so almost half, almost half of the books written in the Old Testament come from a prophet. What does God want us to know about the prophets? They're important. They play an integral role in the story. They play an integral role in the history of Israel and Judah. And the same for us. Who is the last prophet? Malachi. And we would think that's just because that's what the Old Testament ends. John the Baptist is actually your last prophet. 
Jesus, of course, is considered prophet, priest, and king. But John the Baptist is your, your last prophet. And according to the words of Christ, he is considered to be the greatest born among women. So the prophets go, if you look at it, we'll see it. Start with Moses and go all the way to John the Baptist. They cover the beginning of Israel's history as a nation and as a people all the way to John the Baptist who serves as a forerunner uh, for Jesus. So who are they? They are men and a few women in Israel's history who speak on behalf of God. The prophets speak on God's, uh, uh, God's message to God's people. I'm sorry, go ahead. He's, he's an apostle. It is prophetic, but it's prophetic in a different way. We'll, and we'll talk about what a prophet means. A lot of the time we think a, a prophet is just telling you the future. And that's not always the case. They have a message for, for their historical context. Uh, so just kind of the way to look at it, a prophet, an Old Testament prophet, is more of a forth teller. Let me tell you what God is saying about your situation now. Instead of a foreteller. Let me tell you what's coming down the line. So, so John the Revelator is an apostle, but he's more of an apocalyptic. You know, let me tell you what's coming. And he uses a lot of symbolism and imagery. But that's a great question. Uh, that's a great question on that. Men, few women who speak on behalf of God. And this is important. God has a message, but he's going to speak through these individuals. Peter will tell us in 2 Peter 1.21 that these individuals... They did not speak on their own accord. They didn't see what's happening. And then they didn't offer their commentary or their interpretation. And that they didn't look at it and say, well, here's what I think. It, and let me tell you what I think. Let me tell you what I know. That's not the case. God puts his word on their mouth and they speak that. They are inspired and their, their message is miraculous. So God mentions this to Moses in Exodus 4. Jeremiah mentions this in Jeremiah 15, Ezekiel 6. There are numerous examples where the prophets know the message that we have is not our own. It is not mine. I don't own it. I'm not, it's not an interpretation. Uh, so when Peter says they spoke as the Spirit moved, and it's not given to private interpretation, they didn't survey things and say, here's the opinion. We've got so-called individuals on news stations who survey the landscape and they tell you what they think. That's not the prophets. The prophets see what's going on. They're living it. But God places a message directly on their, on their tongue and they give it. So that's who the prophets are. So Moses to Micah, uh, Malachi, excuse me, should, uh, it should be there. You include John the Baptist, if you will. Fifteen books in our Old Testament are considered to be the prophets. So there are two designations for these books. One set is called the major prophets. And one set is called the minor prophets. Anybody know why those designations are given? Ma'am? Okay, the length of the book or the size of the book has nothing to do with somebody being more famous or somebody being more well known. It has everything to do with the size of the book. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations is included in that. Ezekiel and Daniel are all your longer books. They're all your longer books. The minor prophets, Micah that we just read, Nahum, Jonah, others, they are called the minor prophets because they're smaller books. It's just that it's, it's important to know that because we look at it and say, oh, well, Isaiah, Isaiah must be more important than Micah. Nope. He, he just got a longer book. Uh, if you will, when it comes uh, to that. So how did the prophets speak? How did the prophets write? What did they do? They got a message, so how did they speak? They spoke in persuasive ways. When the prophets come onto the scene, God's people and their hearts, mostly, are starting to go away from God. The prophets come to give God's people a wake-up call. That's Elisha's phrase of that, okay? they got to just wake them up. Uh, you'll see the prophets telling, wake up, sleeper, wake up, you're asleep, you who are asleep, wake up. You'll see that language a lot. Well, you'll see this language in the New Testament too. Uh, Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade people. We persuade people. Uh, you'll see the, the sleeping language. Paul will say in Ephesians, those of you that are walking in darkness, wake up. Rise, O sleeper, leave the darkness. 
and come into the light is kind of the idea. It's persuasive language. We know what's coming down the line. God sees that His people are headed in a path that if you don't change, you don't heed and change from the heart, from the inside out, it's not going to end well. So they persuade. Sometimes persuasion doesn't work. So the prophets shock the people. Does anybody know of any shocking stories from the prophets that shock the people and they can't believe what they're hearing and what they're seeing? Okay, Jonah. All right. Jeremiah. What do you know? You mentioned Jeremiah. Jeremiah, what does he do that shocks the people? Okay. You're going to be taken captive. You know how he shocks the people with that message? He doesn't just verbally do it. He walks in to what we would consider a, a, a council of the powers that be. And he puts on a yoke, an oxen yoke. And he wears it. So just imagine if, if the individual comes in here and says, look, you don't change. Captivity's coming. And this is what cap captivity looks like. You're going to wear a yoke. And it's Nebuchadnezzar's yoke. And you need to accept it. Uh, did you know that Isaiah, to show the shamefulness of God's people, will walk naked and deliver his message? You know that Ezekiel, to show the shame of the sin that has perpetrated Israel and Judah, will cook his meal over cow dung? To gout, does that not capture your attention? This is the Hebrew writer that says that people look at them and say they're, they're insane. But they're trying to get the people's attention because look, if you don't change, there's something a whole lot worse than this. Does Jesus use shocking language to gain people's attention? What does he say? What does he do? He turned over some tables. Okay, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. And I, as a mother hen, I would have gathered you. I, I would have done this. But this is coming. He turned over tables. And where were those tables? In God's house. You can't do this in God's house. I can do whatever, whatever, uh, Jeff. If your eye leads you to sin, pull it out. Okay, yeah. Your eye leads you to sin, pull it out. If your harm leads you to sin, cut it off. It's better to enter eternal life maimed than to hell whole. That's, that's language that shocks people. Uh, who does he eat with? Tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes. Does that not shock people? That shocks people. From the positive side, that how radical is God's grace and how far will he go to reach people? It tells the religious leaders, you mentioned Matthew 23. He'll tell them, you need to wash the inside of the cup. On the outside, you look like a whitewashed tomb that's good and it's healthy, but on the inside, you're full of rotten bones. That captures attention. Paul will do the same thing through that. Somebody's raising their hand over here. Uh, you said what I was going to say, Matthew 23. Jesus just totally gave what's more to the Pharisees and just let them have it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I mean, and Jesus stands on these shoulders. John the Baptist. How does he shock people? He eats locusts. And honey and wears camel hair. But how important is God's message to him to inspire a prophet? That this is what you got to do, number one. And then on the other side, how far gone are the hearts of the people that God has to resort to those lengths to wake them up? That's where we are in the time of the prophet. Where we are in the time of the prophets. They, they do a lot of poetry. They do a lot of word pictures. Uh, Hosea, for instance, combines a lot of these elements. So what does God call Hosea, his prophet, to do? Marry a prostitute. What is her name? Gomer. And what is he to do with Gomer? Okay, raise up three children. He's to love her. He's to take care of her. He used to be a husband. If you will. And how does Gomer repay his kindness and his acceptance? And how many times does she go back out? Three. It's very possible that he's called to raise children that are not his own. You don't think that's shocking? 
And the Lord looks at Israel and says, just like Gomer, you were my bride. And I called you. And I took you. And when you walked through the Red Sea, I washed you. I made you holy. And I sanctified you. And what did you do? You followed an idol. Back and forth. Back and forth. You know what Paul will tell us? In 1 Corinthians 6? Don't you know that the unholy and the ungodly do not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he makes the list, and then at the end he tells the church at Corinth, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. I.e., why are you doing the things that you're doing when God has already done this? And it's the same for us. You were washed. That's baptism language. You were sanctified. You were made clean by the blood of the Lamb. You were justified where your guilt was turned into innocence and that guilt and shame and sin was washed away. Why are you continuing to live the way you're living? That's the message of the prophets that's carried over into the New Testament. Yep. He will say that in Matthew 18. How zealous is God for, is Jesus for disciples? He will tell disciples, one among another with a relationship, if one disciple causes another disciple to sin, it's better for that disciple to have a millstone hung around his neck and thrown into the sea than to have done that. How grievous to Jesus, how grievous is it when brothers and sisters of the family hurt brothers and sisters of the family? Yeah, Adam. I think it's just one other shocker where he curses a fig tree as an example of those who are unfruitful. Sure. And the consequences of being unfruitful is God will destroy you. He will. The consequences of that. Patience, even patience, has its limitation. Even patience runs out. So the prophets give us four main messages. The prophets give us four main messages. One, Yahweh is in sovereign control. And it's not just Israel and Judah. It's not just Israel and Judah. Daniel, Obadiah, Jonah are just some examples that God is in sovereign control of all of the nations. For all time. So what does that remind us of citizens of this nation? What does that remind us of our nation? God is sovereign. The affairs of men, they can rule themselves. They're allowed to have that free, rule, uh, free will. They're allowed to have that free reign. Our government is set up in terms of we got a voice. We got to say so to a certain extent. But at the end of the day and at the end of history, who is in sovereign control? God is. Nebuchadnezzar learned this. So what happened to Nebuchadnezzar when he walked out of his palace one day? And he said, look at all the stuff that I've built with my hands. Okay, God came to him because of your pride. We're going to humble you. Nebuchadnezzar becomes the example that if we don't humble ourselves, God will humble us. So look at all that I've built. And Daniel comes in after this vision and says, this is what's going to happen. And it happens. And then he's restored. And what does Nebuchadnezzar do? Do you remember when he's restored? Yep, he repented and proclaimed that God... The God of Daniel. Daniel is so impactful and so influential with the people around him that Nebuchadnezzar comes and says, Daniel was right all along. Daniel was right all along. Don't underestimate your influence with the people that God has placed into your life. Don't underestimate who you are as God's man, as God's woman, and don't underestimate the influence it seems like somebody reminded me in the New Testament that he was speaking of that. Who was that individual that spoke of influence? Jesus. And how does he describe influence? You are salt and light. Don't put it under a basket. The prophets remind us if you stay the course, even if everybody else around you is not, you stay the course. You'll be vindicated at the end. Don't let someone 
Don't let somebody's path to God be ruined because your influence isn't where it needs to be. It's a subtle reminder of us. Yahweh and his moral character. Prophets care about this. So the word that's used is justice. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, we're hearing a lot of this, right? Justice is very biblical. But we need to make sure that we filter it through what the Bible says. With justice, God cares about what's going on in a nation. God is in sovereign control over all nations, not just Israel and Judah. Then he cares about what's happening. And, and Adam, you mentioned Jonah. Why does God go and, and call Jonah to repentance? Well, because he loves and because he cares. But he's also seeing the trajectory of Nineveh. And as Nineveh goes, so does the nation. And God does not want to see that nation lost. God doesn't want to see that. So justice is rooted in Exodus. Old Testament biblical justice is rooted in the book of Exodus. So tell me. I know we covered it a couple of weeks ago. What's the book of Exodus about? Okay, Israel's leaving, but why are, where are they leaving from? Egypt. What has Egypt been doing to them? Enslaving them for how many years? A lot, right? 400 plus years. 400 plus years. God looks at Israel and Judah and says, what I did for you, you are to do for others. What I did for you, you are to do for others. Don't enslave somebody. Human beings are not property. Don't have an imbalanced scale when you're at the market so that you can get more money from somebody. Because Egypt did that. People are not a means to an end. People are the end. Because there's only one part of creation that is created in his image. And what is that? Not scales, not money, not power, not government, not all these other things that we look at. People. People. God sees the people. He hears the people. And because he loves the people and because he made a promise, he helps the people. Israel is to do the same thing. So when you go to court, you are to have a balanced court so that a fair verdict can be attained. That's justice. When you go and you balance your scales and you offer something at the right price in the way that it's supposed to be priced, that's justice. When you pull a mule or a donkey out of a ditch that belongs to your neighbor, and you stop and help, that's justice. And when you see it not happening, especially to the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, you stop what you're doing and you help. And that's what God says. So one of the things that we learn from the prophets, whether it's Israel and Judah, or if it's Nineveh and Assyria, or whoever... God assesses a society on its behavior. God looks at the society that's there, and he says, this is where it is. But it's not based on what man thinks is right or wrong. It's based on who? God. And that's one of the things that we got to keep in mind when we're hearing justice. It's not based on what I think should be done, and it's not based on how I would want it done. It's first and foremost based on what God says. And what God sees, but he assesses the society on his behavior. So Amos, chapter 2 and chapter 5, really the whole book speaks of this. So when the civil rights movement is happening, segregation, Jim Crow, but embedded in that was slavery. Martin Luther King speaks. He reaches down into Amos and he says, justice needs to roll like waters. Because it hadn't been happening. He looks to the prophets and he sees, I see a society, I assess it. But I don't assess it the way that I want to assess it. I assess it through what God says. So God becomes my filter. God becomes how I see things. And specifically, God and his word. And then this is what it leads to. So what do you see at work? All of these things. How can you help? Where can you be? And I know we look at it from a federal. Don't, work, don't look at it from a federal. 
Schools are about to start. Go to your nearest school and ask how you can help with their backpack buddies. You, you want to help? Go and ask how you can donate some items to a school that's closest to you and where you live. We, want, we look at the macro and sacrifice the micro of it. Where can you help? How can you, when you go to work, how can you bring honesty, truthfulness, how can you bring a, a good work ethic? Because if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat, that's justice. Right? But how can you bring that and shine light? How can you show through your actions at work, at home, when you love your wife as you love yourself, or as you love your wife as Christ has loved you and gave himself for you? Is that not justice? When a, when a wife submits to her husband, as she submits to the Lord, is that not justice? Parents who bring their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. See, it's not just a societal thing. It's what's happening even in our very home. And the unity. And God being central. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah. And, uh, he even tells them, he says, pull the, pull the plumb line. Mm -hmm. Measure yourself. Right. God tells them to do that. Pull the plumb line. Measure yourself. You after Amos, pull the plumb line. See what you are like. See yep. where you are level. <laughs> they couldn't do it. No, and they, and they couldn't. And one of the prophets, Malachi, will, will say that one of the reasons why, besides the king, is that the priests were not living up to what they were supposed to live up to. Which was their role of communicating God's word. Yes. Yeah. They were. And that and that carried over where Jesus looks at the Pharisees and the Sadducees and say, You you're supposed to honor your father and mother, but you have figured out a loophole around that. And Jesus calls their hand on it. And when you figure out a loophole on something, Jesus says that's, that's unjust. To not just basic commandment of honor father and mother, which included financial responsibility. You would much rather find a loophole and get around that than to accept what God says. And that's unjust. That's unjust. That's not right. Right? And we look at that. And that's, that's all of our, that's Jesus. But that's all of us. So the plumb line, you're right. And the plumb line, again, is not what the priest says or the king says, is what God says. Because that's how the nation of Israel and Judah are supposed to go. So as a result, because God assesses a society, as a result, God holds those who have power and authority in society accountable for what they do. So kings, priests, men of households, you will read, if you read through the prophets and you undertake that challenge, you'll see how much God calls them. One of the things that need to be done even today within the church are for us as men to rise up and be men in the way that God would have us be men. That's just, that's right, that's fair, that's good, that's true. But the prophets hold that. So kings are held, kings are carried off into captivity. Priests are lost. And it's because you haven't been teaching God's word. Why does injustice happen in Israel's borders? Because they forgot. And the reason they forgot is that God's word did not have the place it should have had. And it's the same with us. Why do we go off the rail? Why do we not walk the straight and narrow? More often than not, God and his word are not the rudder of the ship. But they should be. They must be. Amos speaks of that in Amos 6 and verse 1. But the other, we touched on this last week. So let's say that I worship the way that God wants me to worship. Say I do everything that God wants me to do when it comes. I offer the right sacrifice. I offer the right amount. I go on the specific day. I go to the specific person. I do everything. I make sure that every T is crossed and every I is dotted. I'm good, right? God through the prophets will say over and over and over, outward religion Outward religion is no substitute for ethical transformation. 
if you perform outward religion just for the sake of performance and don't do anything the rest of the week that is just and right and true, then everything that was done is not just unaccepted, but God assigns through the prophets a word that really shocks us. You know what that word is? Abomination. Yea, there are six things that the Lord hates. And seven are what? We know that passage because of that word. You get to the time of the prophets and God's people do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it, but do not carry that out into everyday life. Even if they did what was right in the context of worship, God says it's an abomination. To have outward religion, but no ethical transformation is an abomination. So give me some examples of this. What would this look like? Adam? Pharisee in Luke 18 that went up to the temple to pray with the tax collector. Okay. But he stood up and he said, talking to himself. Okay. I thank God you didn't make me like that. This is what I do every week. All right. He, he ticks off a list of the things that makes he felt was righteous. So did he go to the right place to pray? He did. Yes. And did he do what God told him to do? He did. But how do we know that there was no ethical transformation with this Pharisee? The self-righteousness and my neighbor is my standard. You mentioned the plumb line a second ago, Keith. My neighbor and what he or she isn't doing, that's the standard. So I measure myself up against the neighbor. And by the way, if we measure ourselves, if we compare ourselves to our neighbor, whether it's in here in this building or somewhere else, guess who always wins and guess who always loses in that comparison game? I win, they lose. Right? Because that's the way it's set up. So when Jesus says you don't judge, in Matthew 7, we've already talked about this, he's not eliminating judgment. He's eliminating the standard that makes sure that I can always go up to the temple and pray with self-righteousness. So this, I'll get to you in just a second. But all of this isn't rooted in just the prophets. So Saul, King Saul, what did God tell him to do one day with the Amalekites? Do you remember? Okay, destroy everybody and everything. And Saul does what? Okay, he does all of it except, say it just a little bit louder. Okay, so he keeps the king alive. But then he keeps the cattle, he keeps the gold, the silver, all of those things. And he goes to Samuel, we're paraphrasing here. And he tells Samuel what? What does the king tell Samuel? I did, it. I did it. God said it. I did it. And what does Samuel say? Because this is the prophet who shocks the people and shocks the king in this nature. What is the very first thing that he says to him? What, what is the bleeding of sheep? What it, hey, I hear you telling me you did it, but what, it, what is that? What is that? And then we get the famous line that sets the tone for the rest of the prophets and the rest of the message for Israel and Judah for all time. What does Samuel say? Okay. Does the Lord take delight in that? Behold, to, okay, to obey is better than sacrifice. I would much rather you do what I tell you to do all the time than to do something that I tell you to do some of the time. And yet, that is an uncomfortable but needful truth for me and for us. Because today, I am doing what God wants me to do. But that's not the test. Test will be tomorrow. The test will be a few hours from now. And will obedience matter just as much then as it does right now? Will, will doing the right thing, whether I'm at school, 
or I'm at work, or I'm at home, does it matter just as much then as it does now? Or do I say that this is just sacred? And so what I do here matters more than any other aspect of my entire life. And God, through the prophet, says every aspect of your life on every day of the week for as long as you live, it matters. And if you treat this day as the climax of your obedience to the Lord and all the other stuff is left to be subjective, you might as well have not been here. That's tough. So go ahead very quickly. And that's the reality of it, is that there are no winners. Ms. Doris. Not so much a scriptural reference, but just in transferring it to our lives. When we look for the easy way out, you know, and uh, the two things that came to mind were when I'm, if I'm in school, copying somebody else's test, or plagiarizing something, sure. instead of learning for myself. Yep. Those, those things that from a human point of view we say are little, to God they matter just as much. Because you're getting something for nothing, and that's unjust. Correct. Right. Obviously, right. So we're hurting ourselves more than just in one way, right? We're hurting ourselves in, in more, and we're hurting someone else because we've, we viewed them, again, we viewed a human being and their effort and their work as a means to my end. My end is the good grade. So if I got to use you, then I'll do that. That's why cheating is so bad. Or plagiarism, like you mentioned. Those, those real life examples. And the list could go on, and those, those are there. Adam. I think the summation of everything that you've been saying is found in that first, first Simon 15, uh, 2 through 6. And it's found in the second half of verse 23, where it says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you. Yep. And that is everything all the way up to today. When we reject the word of God, he rejects us. He does. And notice that the rejection, even Saul did 98% of it. The Lord still views it as a rejection because it wasn't all the way. So when you fast forward and you get to a Micah, what are the three things at that time? Do justice, love kindness, Walk humbly. Well, am I doing that? Do I, am I doing justice when I go to work? Because it, it's a do. It's not a belief. It's a do. A, am I part of that? Am I contributing to that? What, if, what am I? But then it's also loving kindness, right? Which is steadfast love. Some of you probably had a version that said steadfast love. It's patient. It's kind. It's merciful. and it teaches truth. All of those things. Walk humbly. You want to just a test? This week, did I walk in humility with my God? You know what happened in the garden when they walked in the garden of the cool of the day with the Lord? They stopped walking humbly. Even Micah goes all the way back to the garden. And Adam and Eve walking with the Lord. What was their humility? They followed him. And they were in full fellowship. And what happens when they don't? Micah is just, these are the things. Yes, ma'am. Yep. It is. It is. Because nothing escapes, and that's God to his people. And the minor prophets remind us God will hold his people accountable. So, Peter, get to Peter. There's this curious statement that he will say toward the end of his book. If judgment begins with the house of God and the righteous are scarcely saved, what then for the world? And we know that statement because all we got to do is look at Israel and look at Judah. And if judgment began with the house of the Lord that was Israel and Judah, what happened about the rest? Give you an idea of that. Um, 
Here's their primary message. And we're, I know we got a few minutes, so we'll close out with this and we'll pick up with it next week. Here's the primary message, though, of the prophets. Their primary message, their number one message was to call Israel back to the covenant. Okay? So, Adam, you mentioned Samuel uh, to Saul. He rejected the Lord of the, word of the Lord. He knew it. Didn't do it. The one distinction mark in Israel's time is they didn't even know the word of the Lord. So the prophets come back and say, you need to stop what you're doing and you need to come back to God. You need to come back to the word of the Lord. When Ezra and Nehemiah, even though they're not prophets, when they come back in exile... One of the very first things they do is restore the reading of God's Word. Those of you that have been with us on 1 Timothy on Sunday nights, one of Timothy's primary responsibilities is do not forsake the public reading of the Word. Calling the people back to the Word. They recall it. They will reinforce it. They will hold. God through the prophets will hold the people accountable. They will explain it. Here's what God says. Here's what you're doing. Now, what do you think you should do? All right? So here's what God says. Here's the current assessment of what you're doing. Now make the appropriate decision. And that's the same thing for us. Here's what God says. Here's my life. Now what do I need to do? It's the idea, right? James. What good is it? What does it profit a man to hear God's word and then walk away and never do it. What does he say? It's like a man who looks in the mirror, makes sure everything is good, walks away and immediately forgets. James stands on the shoulders of the prophets and say, again, this setting is where you need to be and I'm glad you're here. What good will it be to be here and focus on God's word and in a matter of a few hours immediately forget? It is to explain it, to apply it. And this is what the modern day preacher is. And I don't say this just for myself, but I know there are other men in here who get up and you have the opportunity, I'm thankful you have the opportunity to stand before God's people. But the modern day preacher, the person who climbs into a pulpit like this, wherever he may be at this moment, on this day, his responsibility is to call everybody, including himself, back to God's work. This is the call. It's to call, them, call us back. What's fascinating about New Testament worship is that God doesn't do it in just one way. He calls us back through song. Teach and admonish one another through songs and hymns and spiritual songs. The songs we're going to see today are not just melodious and harmony and having harmony and good to the ears and encouraging. They are calling us back to God and His Word. Prayer. Whomever it is that leads us in prayer today, you're calling God's people to our Father who art in heaven, whose name and name alone is hallowed. God is calling us back to His Word. When we participate and we eat bread and we drink juice, we are reminded that the entire covenant that we have is not based just on written word. It is the living Word of God. Who came down and gave himself. So when New Testament Christians. On the first day of the week are called back to the covenant. It's not just a covenant. In words on a page. It, we are called back to Jesus. And we are reminded. There is only one individual. Who lived for me. Died for me. And was resurrected. And when we gather together. The me disappears. And it becomes an us. He died for us. He was buried for us. He was resurrected for us. And the first day of the week is to call you back. Because we forget a lot over the course of six days. And we're pulled in a thousand different directions in six days. And we're told. Blank is most important. Blank is most important. Blank is most important. And every first day of the week, the Lord says no. Jesus is most important. And the prophets did that to Israel. Yahweh is most important. You need to come back to Him. 
It isn't about building a great nation. You'll build a great nation if you will walk humbly with your God. You will do justice if you walk humbly with your God. You will love kindness if you walk humbly with your God. If you will walk. So, as we put a close on this for today, who have you been walking with? And how have you been walking with? And if it's not the Lord, then it's time to change. To obey is better than sacrifice. The class is yours.